good morning, everyone. Um, I just firstly introduce myself. My name's Kevin Wilcox. Um, I'm with a third generation family root crop business based in Pukekohe, New Zealand. Um, I'm also currently a, a board member of the PMA board. And uh, firstly, uh, congratulations on, uh, on firstly and foremost for attending uh, the Fresh Connection conference. Um, it's all about participation. So great to see you all and great for, to see you've made a great choice in attending, uh, visiting Brisbane these last couple of days. The session we um, have for you today is finding ways to utilise 100% of the crop. Just before we kick into that, um, just a bit of a show of hands. Well, uh, obviously we're a supply chain uh, conference here over the next couple of days. And uh, so hands up growers or producers in the room. Yeah, it's about 40, 50%. Hands up uh, distributors or service providers. And hands up retailers. Right, we're going to pick on you guys. <laughs> hey, thanks, lovely to have you with us. So just out, for, out of interest, it looks like we've got about uh, 40 to uh, 50% uh, producer growers. It looks like we've got a balance. Um, we've got a, a small percentage of retail. So, um, so great to have you here. And the balance are suppliers and distributors. Um, just need, like to acknowledge uh, this session's uh, sponsor, the Nelson Company. Obviously uh, had a great presentation this morning and I'm sure you all have, will have enjoyed that already. So just to acknowledge their support of uh, this conference. Um, so this morning um, we we're uh, lucky enough to um, roll off the back of some, some wonderful presentations uh, this, uh, during the day already. Um, I think the, the two comments that I took out of this are real relevant for the session we're working through, and, and that's the one from, from Joe Cross, and that was a real people doing real things. And we've got two wonderful gentlemen to speak to us in this session that are real and are doing real things, and that's so one of the great reasons we, we come to these sort of events. Um, the other comment that we heard uh, from Martin Nebone was that a lot of product is left in the field or within the supply chain. So they're, again, pretty relevant to the topic that we're addressing here, and both, both our speakers will, will be addressing that. So without... Uh, any further from me, uh, I'd like to call uh, Andrew to the stage. Andrew Gartel. Now, what we're going to have a slight break of tradition. I won't be introducing. We'll, uh, we'll ask the speakers to introduce themselves. They can do a far better job than I can. So um, please welcome uh, Andrew Gartel from Great Southern Fresh Produce to, to speak to us. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin, and welcome, everybody. Well. There's a news flash, cherries split in New South Wales, although I think they split everywhere, I think, but they, uh, they certainly, we do a great job of cracking cherries in the south. Um, I'm a fifth generation fruit grower, um, and as you can see, in 1967, child slavery was alive and well. So there I'm out picking a bucket of cherries in a forlorn looking, a forlorn looking block, which is now covered in houses on an orchard that I grew up on the edge of Orange. Um, we grew up on those big orchards. We'd had apples and pears and peaches and plums and grapes and everything else. And, a, uh, uh, and as that land, land was resumed and, and, and covered with houses, we, we moved out into the Canoblis and uh, changed our orcharding to red delicious apples and just kept a few cherries. And, um, and a bit of an opportunistic thing where we had cherries just for Christmas. Uh, the cherry, the red delicious thing started to wind down in the early 90s and it became more and more difficult and export sales were being lost as China emerged as a major uh, apple producer. And um, on a very revealing trip in about 96, 97, I travelled to Asia and realised that uh, yeah, we're on a hiding to nothing with our red delicious apples and maybe cherries were the way to go. So, but on a family farm, it takes a long time to turn, the, turn things around, to take apples out and to plant cherries. And uh, yeah, so all through the early 2000s, that's what we did. In the mid 2000s, we, we realised there was a hell of an opportunity with uh, counter seasonal cherries. So we started to plant a little bit more aggressively and we involved some uh, third parties in uh, yeah, developing some cherry farms. So a quick snapshot of our business. Great Southern is the uh, packing, packing and marketing vehicle. Uh, Very Cherry is the uh, manufacturing cherry juice and distribution of cherry juice. And uh, under, um, there's 21 farms now aligned back to the packing shed, uh, some of which we have an equity in, but most of which are just independent growers and they're con uh, contracted back to the packing shed. And before this winter's planting, there's around 140,000 cherry trees out there, which most of which are just on the cusp of, uh, of production. Uh, with our business, we have a strong focus on exports. 65% um, of our fresh cherries are currently exported. Um, really, our primary market is Asia. A few go into the Middle East, but it's really uh, very Asian-centric. 
enormous opportunities for fresh cherries into Asia. The world produces 2 million tonnes of sweet cherries, but there's only 50,000 tonnes produced in the Southern Hemisphere, so it's a bit of a no-brainer that there's a good opportunity to sell fresh cherries into the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, I guess the key take-home message out of that, that what we've found in developing those a, um, cherry sales is that it, you have to do it yourself and build those personal relationships and spend plenty of time in the markets. And I've had six trips to Asia since September, if that's sort of to, uh, so we spent a lot of time away and building these markets for both fresh cherries and more recently for our juice. Um, we're farming across a pretty diverse area, um, farming in five different districts, and just a snapshot of a few here. Wellington is not the earliest area, we're also at a narrow mine, but uh, at Wellington, uh, so we're harvesting cherries there from late October to mid-November. Um, over at Mudgee, there's quite a few plantings um, where the grape industry has been in some difficulty. And we have planted a, a, few, a few trial dual purpose orchards which have been planted for fresh fruit but where grapes have come out and may ultimately be suitable for mechanical harvesting for processing. So it's sort of like a dual purpose cherry farm. Obviously back home in Orange, um, at the end of the season and the coldest, bleakest part of, the, uh, uh, of our um, uh, harvest window. And um, yesterday in Orange it was from minus three as a low to a top of four, so that slide is pretty right. Um, despite having been in dry years the last five or six years, we've had some really crazy summers and uh, which has really affected our fruit quality. And there's November 2008 at Nashdale and those cherries were only a few weeks out from harvest and we had a fall of snow and you can imagine what that did to ripening cherries. And of course December 2009 rolls around, same thing, there we are with the lapping cherries at Nashdale drying them with helicopters. I think we put the helicopter over that orchard six times in that day and we still didn't harvest the crop, it was still ruined by the rain and, the, uh, and you can see the irrigation dam is full and the paddocks are green so you haven't got much chance growing cherries when it all looks like that. And did it get any worse? Well 2010, we all know what happened and that's not of our farm, so we, had, we actually had a cherry orchard underwater at Wellington and um, and we all know about the extraordinary summer that 2010 was. Uh, on one of the orchards at Nashdale, we had 15 inches of rain in four weeks. So it was, you know, it's been a really, really difficult series of wet, you know, wet summers. Um, so it's all about solutions for the whole crop. Obviously, we're trying to grow a, uh, the type of cherry on the left-hand side, a beautiful pack of, box of packed cherries bound for the export market. But in the reality, we're growing plenty of processing cherries. And, and having processing options makes you a better fresh fruit packer because there's no, uh, there's no reason now to pack mediocre cherries, I guess, from here on in. Um, so just looking at the, very quickly at the production cycle, fruit is received in bulk from the packing shed uh, to a local winery for, a, uh, for processing. Um, a, lot of, a lot of work had to go in sort of developing the process of a, uh, crushing and a, uh, to get a, a viable yield. We're now recovering around 700 litres per tonne, um, but it was a long, long time to get to that and without damaging the expensive wine making uh, bladder presses and the like, so a lot of work and dealing with a, a crop that's or a, a product that's very high in sugar and high bricks, so the potential for fermentation is very real. Um, off, uh, then stored in uh, refrigerated tanks um, and then taken to the bottler in bulk for, a, um, uh, for, for pasteurisation and bottling. And I guess that's all about skilled partnerships, working with the right people. Um, and that's the, uh, one of the winemakers at the, uh, at the uh, bit of a character. And, and he's certainly put a lot of effort into a, uh, developing, um, uh, developing the intellectual property and being able to make a good quality juice. Quick snapshot on the juice there. Um, I guess the feature is it has an extended shelf life at room temperature, about 18 months to two years. Actually, now it comes out with a two-year shelf life, which gives you heaps of options, particularly shipping by sea offshore. Uh, the features of a cherry juice, high in antioxidants. Um, uh, in addition to the, the no sugars, colours or flavours, the juice now has no preservative and has some significant health benefits in relief from arthritis uh, um, and, uh, and gout in particular. So there's a, uh, uh, and lots of, lots of, it's, it's quite well known those, those two uh, properties. Um, I guess the, the, one of the messages I want to emphasise today was it's, uh, lots of cockies have a go at sort of making a, um, some sort of a downstream product to use out of spec fruit. But uh, yeah, the work really begins, and that's probably what we didn't realise in, uh, um, in developing markets. And uh, um, we've, done, we've put, spent an enormous amount of personal effort, time and money in developing this into be a viable, um, viable option. Here's a quick snap on, snapshot of the Australian market. Um, beverage wholesalers, fruit barns, supermarkets, health food stores, cafes and also online. Probably the, and the, the online one is really growing. I think we've sold three pallets this month online. So a, um, there's some interesting stuff happening there. And there we are all doing different in-store promotions. That's with an old label, but in a fruit barn in um, Sydney and 
that's the one in the, the light blue shirt's my accountant. He was so worried about us. He even came down. It was the Harris Farm Markets in Sydney, and he's out there uh, uh, promoting cherry juice with me one Saturday in the store. So that's the sort of level of effort that everyone sort of put in. When you know your accountant is coming to hand out cherry juice, you know you've got some good allies. Um, we've also, because of the um, focus with our fresh fruit for export, uh, we've also worked very hard uh, on export markets. Um, certainly the juice is now retailing in Hong Kong, Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, one of the dot points has disappeared there on the pending, but uh, um, we've got samples into Japan, um, lots of interest from China. We're just, just developing our China label now. Uh, we're stuck with the food uh, import people in Thailand getting the final, final approval, and we're almost ready to go in South Korea. So uh, uh, lots of good things happening overseas with the juice. Um, there's a couple of examples of promotions from this year. Uh, I did Hofex in Hong Kong only a couple of weeks ago. We were there for four days and uh, uh, promoting our cherry juice at, in Hong Kong. And uh, earlier in the year, uh, we did a uh, the Australian Fair promote part of the Australian Fair uh, promotion with um, Austrade in Singapore, and that was in the Isotan supermarket, and that was very very successful. I think Isotan was selling around 100 bottles a day um, at the end of that promotion, which is which was pretty huge. So. Uh, there's an example, I guess, of where that leads to, and, and further, I guess further promotional work. You can see the very cherry there at 46 uh, Hong Kong dollars a bottle, which is really only about $5 odd Aussie, so it's really only, you know, we've certainly worked on a reduced margin. They've worked at a reduced margin to get the product out there and promote it and uh, get it rolling in park and shop, and um, they've only contacted me in the last few days and have now put the cherry juice into 20 stores, so that's a great outcome, so we, um, uh, to, have the, to have the juice established in 20 stores in Hong Kong. Uh, I guess just very, very quickly um, in wrapping up, um, it, it takes you a while to get to work through all of this. There was you know, three or four years there of a, uh, a product development trials and all sorts of uh, you know, unsuccessful ways we went about it. We made a mediocre juice in 08 and um, sold it where we could and gave plenty away and, and whatever else. I guess 09 was the first commercial bottling um, and we got those yields up to where it needed to be to be a viable product and uh, we got our first small export sales away in 09. You know, now in 2010 um, we saw the potential of the product, uh, we brought an equity participant into the, um, hived off that section of the um, business, brought an equity participant in. Um, we've obviously been out working hard on the promotions and sales and we've also trialled some blended products. We've made a uh, small amount of um, uh, cherry and pomegranate which has worked really well and we've trialled some cherry and apple, so I think we, we needed a, a bigger range of uh, um, products. And I guess that's our goal for 2011, to process 250 tonne of uh, uh, cherries, and uh, um, uh, we need to probably improve our packaging. It's probably a little bit, we feel it's a little bit amateurish, and the, uh, the label's quite, we feel is okay, but probably the bottling needs to be a little bit more unique, and uh, uh, so that's, that's sort of uh, one of our focuses for next year, the, uh, the expanded products and, uh, and further, further promotion and, and market development. So. Yeah, I guess that's it. Thank you.